So I started at the lowest possible level. And that was key. Just not, you know, not thinking, oh, yeah, well, I can jump right in here at this mid-level, save myself a couple of years. No, I went down to the rock bottom and said, I got to root this thing out and really start start over again. So, um, but I think what this tells people in general is that you can make shocking changes in your identity your identity, who you think you are and what you think you're capable of if you take little tiny steps to make progress in that area. So that's, I, I think that was a, a valuable insight for me. And I think it can be a valuable insight for everyone. You know, don't necessarily think I'm going to be a doctor. That's my, I mean, you can put a picture of that up. But just say, I'm going to take this one little course that will give me an introduction so I can take the next course, you know, on math or, or whatever I need to become a nurse, to become a technician, to become a doctor, become an engineer. Start tiny and, and only focus at that step that's needed. A lot of people in this world can benefit from the wisdom you just shared, which is it is the most intelligent move to assume you're not smart. <laughs> yes. And it yeah. sounds like an oxymoron, but yeah, I think, um, you know, behavioral economics, a lot of it is devoted to what people days do when they're overconfident. A lot of people are overconfident and it either leads to recklessness and which results in bad results. Or at one point they realize they're, they're not as great as they are and it demotivates them and they quit altogether. So, so it so makes me laugh. Some of you know, the students in my classroom that are like, you know, I'm not sure I can do this. I'm 15 years older than the other people in this class. I'm really unsure. I'm like, I don't worry about those. It's the ones that come in. They're super cocky. You know, oh, I got this. I'm, I'm going to, those are the ones you worry about. So yes, uh, if you have a bit of that imposter feeling that you, you're kind of a fake, that is a very good sign because it means you're perceptively looking at the fact that you do need to change and that will leave you more open to actually changing. Speaking of uh, 15 years older, do you feel like there is a certain age that after that point, it probably is hard to do a complete shift, shift in your life going from uh, a language learner to an uh, engineer? Um, is there one point as a certain age, like, ah, maybe it's more realistic to not go down that path? Oh, well, that's a good question. And part of the reason it's a good question is because it depends on all the other factors you've got going on in your life. We know that the brain is enormously plastic. So in your 50s, 60s, 70s, you can make a lot of changes. You can learn lots of new things. But usually by your 50s, 60s, 70s, you've also um, got lots of other commitments. You've got family and friends, and you're really kind of, it, it's hard for you to like, pull away from everything the way you could like when you were in your, uh, you know, your teens and twenties and really devote some time. So I, I think that you could switch even in your seventies, if you wanted to, and you were able to devote a, a lot of your time to that focused attention that you would need. Will you think in the same way, uh, will you have the same ease with the material that if someone learned it when they were, you know, starting from their teenage years? No, you won't, because a lot of their learning would have taken place with what's called the procedural basal ganglia learning that would have played a, and that is, it plays a more important role when you're young and it helps make you fast and flexible. But at the same time, you will learn more declaratively. And that means that what you learn, even though you can't access it swiftly, you can think about it more flexibly. And so you, there's advantages and disadvantages in, in you know, learning at any age. Um, I, one thing I do have to laugh is so I, when I'm, I'm learning Spanish now because our son-in-law is from Chile and so our 
grandchildren are going to be all bilingual. And I'm, but my daughter and son-in-law, they're always laughing at me because they're like, you know, when you speak Spanish, you speak it with a Russian accent. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it bleeds in there. I can't help that uh, earlier procedural learning. That's okay. Uh, you can still learn at any age. Yeah, actually, uh, case in point, uh, I have some friends who uh, work at Google and this is 10 years ago, so it might be different now, but they said I, in, in, at Google, they have a star coworker who was a doctor until 63 years old. And then he suddenly decided that, hey, he wants to be an engineer. He started learning coding. And then within a couple of years, joined Google and he is one of the best programmers at Google after a whole life of learning medicine and biology. So uh, wow. it's a, uh, but he brings insight from his previous career as well into that programming. You always think, Oh, it, it was, that's just, that's in the past, but there's always these uh, insights that you bring uh, from your previous training that give you unusual ways uh, you know, and more creative ways of working on what you're working on. Yeah. One thing uh, that got me very intrigued about your story is that a lot of uh, concepts, principles talk about humans would move forward with, uh, would, would take the path with the least resistance, right? But when I hear your, you know, your life paths, those don't sound like paths with least resistance, you know, from joining the military to learn language to, you know, sign. Uh, if you wanted to make a living, actually completely go into university, learn engineering, and then grow from there. I, um, and we know sometimes people prefer a path of unpredictability, which is, you know, a little bit more uncertain. You don't feel as confident, but it's, it's more adventure. You mentioned the word adventure a few times. I also know people who say, yeah, I did this because it was very hard and I want to do hard things. I want, to I want my life to be challenging. So what's your uh, understanding of this principle of do people go down paths that have the least resistance that are easiest or in what scenarios do they take paths that are actually pretty hard on, almost on purpose? Oh, that's a good question. It's almost like, is there a theory that can predict which way people will go? Um, and I think it, it depends a lot. Um, you know, that's always the answer to anything. You can sound intelligent. All you have to do is say, it depends. And, uh, but if there's research, recent research has shown that pe people who um, like take the time to make themselves uncomfortable in what they're learning or doing sometimes actually end up happier. So it's, it's a wonderful paper. And um, so I don't know, did I recognize that? Um, Early on, do we who challenge ourselves with uncomfortable situations um, kind of recognize that that's a way to um, to help ourselves feel happier in the end? I I don't know. For me, it feels so good sometimes not to be in these precarious situations that I almost look for these precarious situations because I know it's going to feel so good after I'm done. So does I, I like walk, watching Jackie Chan in the movies. And have you ever noticed, like, he looks totally terrified when he's doing some of those, you know, stunts. And I read his autobiography and he actually is totally terrified when he's doing those stunts, but he just does them because you know, because he, he does, he, he has to, but he feels really relieved when they're done. It's not like he's this super brave guy who just goes out and does all this stuff and is completely fearless. Um, and sometimes I feel a little the same. I feel very uncomfortable when I'm doing some of these things, but I, I feel so wonderful when they're done and I'm looking back on them that I crave that feeling. And I, Next thing you know, I'm looking for another unusual adventure to, to go on. So for Jackie Chan, uh, not doing this, it's actually pretty interesting. Like from objective standpoint, I think it's not a intelligent thing to take the risk of getting hurt, right? Because if he gets hurt, the movie can happen. But he feels like 
that could be his epic meaning calling that he wants to be as real as it gets even though as an actor he wants the acting to be real not have someone else act the part that he's acting and and of course he does a lot of comedy you know uh, action movies so the the terrified face always adds a, a sense of like humor to it it's funny to see him terrified but you know doing awesome things and beating everyone up in the scared funny face uh, but like you said, it's, I actually didn't know that he was genuinely terrified. So, uh, and, and I think that makes people relate to him more, right? It's like, hey, you know, you see, you don't see all the CGI action, you know, just all the enemies around you are fake, graph, uh, no, uh, fake graphical creatures, but this person's actually going through things uh, that, that, that is dangerous. And it's dangerous, and like you said, it's, you see them committing to their work so much, and as a result, you honor their work more. Yes, yes. And uh, I, we were talking a little before about uh, online learning. And one of the things that, uh, and this relates in a bizarre way, at least in my mind, to uh, putting the effort into whatever you're teaching and whatever you're creating you know, as a, as a game. People can tell the difference between something that's slapped together by a teacher as opposed to something that, you know, it's, it's your epic meaning and calling and you, even the small details matter. And, and research shows that, you know, if you put that effort into even the small, smaller details, I mean, it's not like you had to have some movie production because I did a lot of the video editing to start with. Uh, and trust me, I'm no professional video editor, but people could really see that there was a lot of, you know, meaning um, you know, it meant a lot to me. And I think people that cause people to uh, bring out the best of them in, in their learning, whatever that is. Yeah, I think if you look at a, a game, and if the game had zero obstacles, right, it's just smooth and easy and comfortable, you just keep going forward, 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 and you win, you beat the game. That's a really boring game. Right. Most people don't want to play a game like this, you know, the path of zero resistance. And so that's why you, have, you start facing obstacles, enemies, pits, like even the game of golf, right? You don't just pick up the ball, put it in the hole. They have to, so you have to stand a certain distance. You have to hit it with a weird stick and there's sand, uh, you know, little, little puddles and, and sand hills that make increased frustration. And those things actually make it more interesting, more meaningful to overcome. And, and I think, a lot of people don't see that gameful mentality in their own lives. When they hit obstacles, they go into a almost a victim mentality. Like, oh, why does my life uh, suck so much? Why do I have such bad luck and start complaining? But I think it's useful to see it as a, a viewpoint of, hey, every obstacle is a chance to grow, evolve, and uh, become, you know, score higher in this game of life. Uh, and I think people with that attitude tends to... Uh, you know, proactively do on average a bit better than those who don't have that attitude. And the question is, have you, um, have you seen what could motivate people to take that path more, to, to take on the difficult path because they want to feel like this, this is strong achieving or, or potentially happier if they do that? Yes. So I'll give you an example. So a learner who took the course Learning How to Learn she has severe dyslexia. And so she was an interior designer and she thought that that was pretty much it as far as her career. She really couldn't learn anything new or different. She really couldn't do anything at all that was technical. And then she took learning how to learn, which was basically, a, you know, you can learn. And it's, not, it's a course that's taught by, um, a neuroscientist phys slash physicist and me as a uh, sort of a slapdash engineer, but they could see that we were walking the walk. We weren't like a bunch of psychologists. I mean, I like psychologists and they do great work, but many of them are like, and here's how you learn, but they've never learned in the tough areas of advanced math and science. And so they don't realize that some of the techniques they're espousing are uh, actually contradictory. You know, they, they're counterindicated for effective learning. So what this woman did was she learned that she could learn despite her dyslexia. Great job finishing part two. 
Now, there's actually a part three, so why don't you go get that?